So welcome all to this uh, new Continual AI online meetup. This is, this is a series uh, of meetups we are organizing with the Continual AI uh, almost every month. And the, essentially the idea is to have four different speakers introducing their works or their ideas about a particular topic uh, in continual learning, of course. And uh, today the meetup is about robustness and generalization in continual learning. And today we have the uh, honor to host four different speakers. Uh, we have uh, Guido Van de Van, who is gonna talk first about his recent work, uh, Brain Inspired Reply Replay for Continual Learning with Artificial Neural Networks. Then we are gonna hear from Jean Battista Parascandolo from the Mark, uh, Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems talking about learning independent causal uh, mechanisms. And then uh, his presentation uh, will be followed by uh, the presentation from George Mendes from the University of Pennsylvania, talking about lifelong learning of compositional structures. And in the end, we will hear from Akilan Cooper from the University of California, Irvine, uh, that is gonna, is gonna talk about the robustness centralization in the brain. Uh, so we have uh, quite uh, an interesting lineup of, of uh, speakers with uh, different ideas that I hope will convey the importance of robustness and generalization in continual learning. And after these, uh, let's say, 15 minute presentations each, uh, we are going to have like a 30 minutes discussion, open discussion in a panel style mode. So uh, I prepared a couple of questions that I am going to uh, ask uh, the different speakers to answer if they want, uh, and of course, it's going to cover some of, of, of the work they have been making uh, for their research. So I hope this will trigger also uh, other questions from the audience that can, of course, uh, ask their questions and trigger an, an interesting discussions for all the other <laughs> continual, continual learning researchers and, and continual AI members out there. Uh, so thank you all for joining and thank you the speakers for joining. And now I will leave uh, the word to Ido for the first uh, spotlight, let's say, presentation. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Vicente. Uh, let me share slides. Okay, um, everyone can see the slides, right? Just to yes, yes, yeah. thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Vicenzo, for uh, the invitation to present my work here. Um, and so, in the next well, twelve or thirty minutes or so, I will present uh, this paper, uh, brain-inspired replay for continual learning with uh, artificial neural networks, uh, which is joint work with uh, with Hava Siegelman and uh, Andreas Tolias. And well, unfortunately, I won't have enough time to uh, to cover everything or, or go into uh, too much uh, depth um, of all the experiments. Um, but you can check the, the full uh, details of the experiments that I'm about to present in this uh, reference here. Uh, and I'm also happy to answer uh, any questions during the presentation as well, if, um, if that's uh, if that's intended or not. I don't know. Um, or or afterwards, of course. Okay, um, let's start. Um, so the, the goal of this work um, was to equip uh, artificial deep neural networks uh, with replay and with, uh, uh, with generative replay in particular. Uh, and our motivation for trying to do so was, uh, was twofold. Uh, so the first motivation, uh, which I would say is, is purely deep learning focused, is that we, that we hope that adding replay uh, might be an effective way to prevent catastrophic forgetting in, uh, in neural networks. Uh, and so to enable these networks to do continual learning. And so this motivation is, of course, most relevant for, for this group. And so in this presentation, I will mainly focus on this uh, deep learning contribution of our work. Uh, but I also wanted to just quickly um, uh, mention that another goal of our work has been to, uh, to explore the use of, of replay in artificial neural networks uh, as a new uh, computational model for, for understanding the role of replay in, in memory consolidation in the brain. Okay, so the uh, the first question then uh, for, for, for both of these aims is uh, how to add replay to an uh, artificial neural network. So one uh, relatively straightforward way 
um, is uh, is to store data from previously learned tasks and, and then interleave it with the current task training data. Uh, this is typically referred to as uh, exact or uh, experience replay. And well, this approach um, can indeed work very well, uh, as many of you have probably experienced, um, but there are a few well, potential issues. Uh, so firstly, uh, well, relevant for, 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 um, uh, for us, is that from a neuroscience perspective, it's uh, it's unclear um, how the brain could directly store data. Uh, for example, how it could store all the pixels of an image. Uh, but uh, more importantly for, for this particular presentation is that uh, relying on stored data also has uh, some disadvantages from a, a machine learning perspective. Uh, for example, uh, uh, storing data might not always be possible in practice. Uh, think of privacy or safety concerns. Um, so an, an alternative to storing data is to, uh, to, to generate the data to be replayed uh, using a generative model. And uh, but this approach also has the advantage that it is, um, uh, at least in potential, uh, a more scalable way of remembering previously seen data. Um, which, which I think might uh, become especially important when, uh, when continual learning is scaled up to, uh, to true uh, human scale lifelong learning. Um, okay, so so yeah, so 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 for these reasons, we focus in in our work on on generative replay. Uh, but I do think it's important to stress that this doesn't not mean that I think that replaying stored data is is not useful or not worth studying. Um, quite quite the opposite, actually. I think uh, I think that for many like practical continual learning problems, if if you only care about the performance on the particular problem and and storing data is is possible, uh, then I would indeed recommend you to basically store the data and simply replay that stored data, uh, because uh, that generally is the quickest and easiest way to get a good solution. Um, and well, I would say that actually um, a lot of the uh, of our results or experiments are um, also have relevance for uh, for such exact replay. Um, yeah, and so so basically the main point of this slide is just that uh, to to emphasize that maybe from a scientific perspective, if you will, uh, and for the reasons listed here, uh, that studying and trying to improve generative replay is, is also very important. Okay, um, so so then, uh, does generative replay work? Well, uh, for, for MNIST-based problems, uh, the answer certainly is uh, yes, it, it works very well. Uh, and it particularly works very well for a type of uh, continual learning referred to as uh, as class incremental learning here on the right. Uh, in such class incremental learning, uh, the main challenge is that a neural network must learn to distinguish between classes uh, that are not observed together. Uh, for example, for the, uh, the split MNIST example shown here, the, the network never directly observes a one and a two together. Uh, but yet at the end of training, uh, it is supposed to be able to distinguish between those two digits. And well, I think this type of problem can be seen as a, as a, as a type of generalization that the network needs to do, um, sort of to, to fit in with the, the theme of this meeting. Um, but I should say that, uh, that also for other types of continual learning, for example, uh, incrementally learning different tasks or incrementally learning different domains, uh, generative replay achieves very strong performance on, 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 on such endless based problems as well. Uh, it's just that for those other continual learning scenarios, the gap with competing methods is, is smaller. Um, okay, so, so yeah, these initial results just highlight uh, generative feedback as a promising tool for continual learning, uh, but there are of course a few concerns. And well, firstly, as uh, as again probably most of you are, is that uh, MNIST is a relatively simple toy problem, and in particular, MNIST digits are, are relatively easy to generate. So, so this raises doubt as to whether a generative replay will still be successful for, uh, for problems with more complicated inputs. Uh, and secondly, and, and this is a concern that, that also very much applies to, uh, to replaying store data, is that uh, constantly retraining on all previous tasks uh, seems very inefficient, seems very computationally inefficient. Um, okay, so let's first try to address this uh, this first issue of, of efficiency. 
And for this, I should first point out that uh, in our implementation of replay, uh, actually to start with, it is already not the case that each previous task is um, what you say uh, fully replayed. Uh, because what we do is that uh, in, in each iteration, um, always only a fixed amount of, um, of samples is replayed, uh, regardless of the number of previous tasks or episodes. Uh, and this is done to make sure that the, the computational costs of replay uh, do not increase with, uh, with number of previous tasks. Um, but we then asked whether um, the amount of replay um, could also be reduced further. And quite strikingly, I think uh, we found that for, for a split MNIST, um, even replaying a single generated example shown here. Um, so for this example, that means uh, one replayed sample for every 128 samples from the current task uh, already resulted in, in very competitive performance. Uh, okay, and then uh, similarly, uh, we next asked whether um, it could also be acceptable to, uh, besides the quantity of the replay, to also reduce the quality of what's being replayed. Uh, and for this, we, we systematically varied the, the size or the capacity of the, of the generative model being used. Uh, and again, we found that the performance of generative replay uh, was rather robust, uh, because even with, uh, with replayed samples, like, like these ones on the left, the, the performance of, well, of generative replay was still uh, very competitive. And well, so I think these results are, are, are very promising as they, they indicate that the basically even relatively small amounts of just good enough replay uh, could already be, uh, be very helpful for continual learning. Uh, and oh yeah, I, I wanted to quickly mention that uh, an intuition for, for why this is possible uh, is essentially that um, that not forgetting is, is a lot easier than, than learning or, or learning from scratch. Uh, and in our paper, we actually confirmed this intuition with a control experiment, uh, if you're interested. OK, and so and then well, inspired by these uh, by these results, we next asked um, what about problems with, uh, with more complex inputs? Uh, for example, uh, natural images, how does generative replay uh, do on these problems? So, well, unfortunately, uh, in, uh, in line with several other reports, uh, we found that, uh, that standard versions of generative replay uh, break down for, for problems with such more uh, complex inputs, uh, as illustrated here on the, on the CIFAR 100 data set. And, well, note that this result essentially means that the, uh, that the class incremental learning on, on natural images uh, it's really still an, an unsolved problem in deep learning uh, because so far only methods that uh, that store data are able to uh, achieve acceptable performance on on this type of problem. Um, so okay, to to then to try to address this, um, we we proposed a, a new uh, what we call brain inspired version of of generative replay. And well, starting from uh, the, the standard version of generative replay with, uh, with the variational autoencoder as, uh, as the generator, uh, we made these four uh, brain inspired modifications that, that are schematically illustrated on this slide. And well, very briefly, in, in, in our version of generative replay, uh, the network is asked to, uh, to replay uh, abstract high level representations rather than uh, than detailed pixel level images. Uh, and moreover, these, uh, these replayed internal representations, uh, they are generated by, by the network itself uh, through its own uh, context modulated feedback collections. Um, well, unfortunately, I don't have time to really go over the details of our, met uh, our method, but uh, I'd be very happy to, to talk about them later uh, or offline if anyone's interested. Um, I think I, uh, I just have some time left to, to quickly show the results. Um, and well, for the, the class incremental uh, learning version of, of CIFAR 100, uh, we found that our uh, brain inspired replay method uh, significantly improved upon uh, standard generative replay. Um, although I should say that its performance still remained uh, substantially under the, the upper bound of, of always uh, training jointly on, on all classes in so far. 
Uh, but nevertheless, um, we're not aware of any uh, continual learning method that performs better on this, uh, on this challenging problem uh, without relying on stored data. Uh, and then finally, um, we found that combining our brain-inspired replay approach with synaptic intelligence, uh, which uh, importantly is a, is a method that uh, by itself um, um, does not work on, uh, on this class incremental learning problem, uh, we found that this combination um, uh, substantially improved performance further, uh, thereby further closing the gap towards the upper bound of joint training and, and actually starting to, to result in quite acceptable performance. Um, okay, so well, that was it. Uh, this last slide just summarizes uh, the main points of what I talked about. And uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I won't go over them. I just uh, I want to quickly thank uh, a number of people and acknowledge the, the funding sources and then um, yeah and then maybe if, if there's time left for questions but maybe if a chance that we want to do that at the end uh, but anyway I'll put back the the summary slide in case anyone wants to go over the main points again and thank uh, you thank you so much Guido for your very interesting presentation uh yeah maybe we have time for just one quick question just if the, someone in the audience is willing to, to ask it now, and then I think we can uh, leave uh, the time for more questions after the four speech uh, so that we, we, we have a uh, um, time for the discussion in the end. I have a quick question. Um, when you said, um, conditional replay, um, I think intuitively people would expect that to be replay conditioned on the environment in some way. Um, but I don't think that's what you're actually doing, is it? Um, um, yeah, so well, so, so it's, um, let me go back to the, So there's sort of kind of two kind of con conditionings. So there's one conditional replay here, um, which is saying that essentially um, that we use a, um, a generator, a, a conditional generator. So um, instead of sort of using a, a standard variational OGE encoder that's trained on, um, on 100 classes, in which there's no um, sort of no, um, no fixed way of, of sampling from a particular class, we use a conditional variational OGE encoder. So that um, essentially there is a, um, um, in, we, we use a, a Gaussian mixture for, for the prior of the uh, variational OGE encoder with a different mode for, uh, for each class to be learned. Yeah, but um, what you're replaying seems to be independent of the content of the real batch. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And so, don't you think that that potentially um, could be a source of inefficiency? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, th yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, so we did, we did do some experiments and we did play around with that because, because, yeah, I, I agree. I was expecting um, that it should be possible to, to get some gains by um, by replaying very specific classes. So, for example, if you if you observe a particular new class, that then um, it makes most sense to 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 um, uh, preferentially replay those classes that are a bit similar to the newly observed class. Yes. Um, yeah. So we did play around with that a bit, but yeah, essentially, it there were a few problems, and it it sort of the kind of straightforward applications of this idea did not result in improved performance. Okay, so I'm, that's I'm, really interesting. It, it, it won't, but, but yeah, so we did try it to some extent, but uh, yeah, it's it's not as simple as sort of the initial. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, in the brain, replay is extremely, yeah. Yeah. Um, the order is extremely non uh, intri uh non trivial right like it's yeah. it's the order is very important so i think this is one thing that um yeah it, it's like a gap that that could could yeah. well needs to be filled at some point yeah yeah exactly i think that that is exactly the sort of i mean yeah i, I think it's 
I think you're right that that's probably the main difference between how replay is currently used in uh, in deep learning, in continual learning, versus um, how people think replay uh, operates in the brain. Yeah, yeah. I completely Thank agree. You. Right. Thank you, Tim, for your question. I think uh, that uh, I know why you're asking this. I think that you have a paper uh, that is called Automatic Recalling Machines or something like that that uh, actually does yeah. that, right? So <laughs> I, I invite you all the people here uh, to, to check that paper out because it's, it was great. And it was introducing this, uh, this new idea, I think, one of the first papers, introducing this idea of somehow conditioning the replay uh, based on the current yeah. website. So I, I was very inspired. Agents. I was very inspired by Guido's work, actually. So, um, great. yeah, it's great to hear you talk. <laughs> cool, thanks. Cool. All right, but maybe we can uh, continue this discussion later on, and now we can leave uh, the stage to Gian Battista, right? It was the second one in our uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Chad, also uh, thank you, Gian Battista, for being here, and uh, if you want, you can start presenting uh, and and start your speech now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. I hope you can all see my screen. Yes. Yeah, full screen. Cool. Yep. All right. So uh, today I'm going to talk about this work. Uh, it's called Learning Independent Causal Mechanisms. It's work I did with uh, my colleagues Nikki, Matteo, and Bernard. Um, and we presented now almost three years ago at ICML in 2018. Cool. So um, let's start with a little bit of motivation. Maybe kind of like try to close your eyes and think back at the times where you learn to recognize digits for the first time. You were probably in I don't know, kindergarten or something like that. And uh, the good thing is that things were very easy back then. Maybe, you know, you saw digits for the first time and they looked very nice and clean and they were uh, pretty uh, sharp and uh, easy to fix into, fix into your mind. And yeah, this is basically maybe how you learn digits the first time. And you could say, you know, how you train your digits classifier in some sense. Um, and then as life went on, you probably start to see things uh, change a little bit. Maybe, you know, sometimes um, things will be maybe moved a little bit more upwards or a bit on the side. And, you know, at times maybe they would even change color or there would be noise added to them. But then you could still kind of figure out, well, this is still the same five in some sense. And it seems unlikely to think that you retrain the classifier for each of these transformations every single time. You know, you don't have like a million five classifiers in your head. It sounds more likely that you you see these mechanisms appear all the time, like translation and color inversions and so on, and then just learn to invert those, and then you get to reuse stuff that you trained in the past. In this case, your precious kindergarten um, classifiers for digits. Um, so this is kind of the setting we're going to look into. Uh, we call the distribution of uh, nice looking digits, for example, the, the canonical distribution. And um, we talk about the transform ones as the transform distributions. And uh, the goal will be to, you know, by getting these two things together, try to get back those mechanisms in such a way that we can do lots of nice things with them. For example, recombine them, reuse them, uh, mix them, and so on and so forth. Cool. So the nice thing about humans, if you think about these mechanisms, is that these mechanisms do seem to transfer. So in the wild, you might see all of these um, weird digits, and then you know your internal representation looks like that. And this kind of um, backs the question: Okay, how do how do we actually do this? And then one possibility is that uh, oh sorry, and and then. You know, the, the good thing is that they, they transfer, sorry, I should have made, said this earlier, the talk is from three years ago, so maybe I, 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 might, um, <laughs> I might make some mistakes on the, on the way. But yeah, if you think about it, the good thing is that this, this transfer. So even if you learn them in one context now, you can transfer to a new context. You know, so you learn them based on these, on these uh, digits. Now you see a picture of my cat, uh, inverted color. I'm pretty sure most of you at least haven't seen this picture of my cat before, or maybe inverted pictures of cats, you can still recognize that's a cat. So something's going on in your brain. You never train on this, but it still works. Now, perhaps the brain does this via some sort of modularization. So it's just learned all of these mechanisms, devoting a different part of the brain to, you know, um, up left inversion and down inversion and color inversion, inversion and uh, noise inversion and so on. So this is a little bit like the motivation that we that we took in this in this work as well. So let's state it clearly. Uh, what's the goal? The goal is to learn inverse mechanisms to map the transform distributions back to the canonical distribution. 
and here's the uh, more interesting part, we want to do this in an unsupervised, modular and reusable fashion. Okay, so, um, so why are we talking about independent causal mechanisms? Well, there are some assumptions from causality that we use to uh, describe our setting. More specifically, um, this idea that two mechanisms X and Y, for example, you can think of this as you know, learning translation and learning to invert color. You can say these are independent if the complexity of the conditional mechanisms, for example, um, learning how to change the color of something, given that you already know how to translate it, is not any easier than learning it if you don't know how to translate it. And then one way this has been expressed formally in the literature in, in causality is, is by saying that uh, the Kolmogorov complexity of the mechanism Y is the same as the conditional uh, Kolmogorov complexity given X. And um, yeah, I hope this is this is kind of clear. This is an assumption we have and that uh, inspired the method we use. Again, the intuition is just that there are some things that if you learn about, it won't make it any easier to do other things. And that's that's why you can call them independent, basically. Um, cool. So why, why are we doing this? Maybe this is the slides that's most interesting to um, to people who are interested in continual learning. Um, if this works, then um, let's say that each mechanism is inverted by one expert. And one expert now is, you know, one this little tiny piece of your brain that just does this one thing. Um, you can think of it as a neural network. Um, so if each mechanism is inverted by an expert, then if you get new data, you can just retrain the relevant expert. You don't have to retrain all of them necessarily. If there is a new distribution, if things went well, you can reuse the experts that you trained, like the example we had with the cat. You learn color inversion on uh, on digits. Now you move to the cat, and you don't have to retrain things. You can just reuse them. Um, if a new mechanism appears, uh, then you can just add the new expert. You know, dedicate a new piece of your brain to doing that. And if there's a new combination you haven't seen before, you might just be able to combine experts that you that you learned in in the in the past. Cool. So now I'll describe the training set we use, which was very very simple. Um, we take MNIST. And then we split into half. They say the first half is the canonical distribution, and we don't touch it anymore. And then the second half, we split it into 10 parts. Um, each part is transformed with one of the mechanisms you saw earlier. So lots of translations in all kinds of directions, color inversion, and, um, and noise. So there are no matching pairs between uh, training and, and test. And there are also no matching pairs between the, you know, the canonical data and the, and the um, uh, transform digits. So you, you know, you don't have labels for any any of those, and they actually don't even exist direct matching pairs. Cool. So now a, a quick overview of the of the method. How does it work like? So you start by taking your digits. In this case, it's a five with a little bit of noise on it. And then you you uh, pass it to a set of experts. This is E1 to EM, and you know in our case these were these were all CNNs, and now each of them is trying its best at you know transforming this this five. At the very beginning, they're all initialized as the identity, so you will just get the identity. But you know this screenshot is from somewhere at some point in the middle of training, so you see each of them is trying something a little bit different. Now you would like to say that one of these things looks better than the other ones. In this case, it's probably a three. And one way we can measure this is by taking the canonical MS distribution and then use it to train, for example, a discriminator or a DAE. You could think of this as a kind of like a fitness model that tells you um, how realistic does something looks. And then, you know, if you use a GAN, the discriminator comes in handy. If you use a VAE, you could use the reconstruction loss or maybe the KL just to get a feeling for, you know, how realistic something looks. Then um, you know this will kind of be, it's going to be some sort of judge that gives you a score for all of the digits that uh, you got an output, and then in this case the judge agrees with with us. Uh, the digit number three looks best, so that's declared the winner, and that's the one and the only one that gets gradients to train. So basically we're saying the one that does the best job at something is the one that gets trained, and now here comes back the assumption about the independence of mechanisms. If you get better at doing, um, in this case, uh, noise, uh, let's say denoising, 
uh, you're not getting any better at doing translation. So if a digit that you have to translate to make better appears, now this expert is not getting any better at that, and then another expert should win this other competition for the other digit. Okay, this is this is the hope. Now we can see that this is actually com uh, confirmed, at least in the experiments. So you see 10 plots. Each plot shows you the score that you get from a discriminator when you look at the output from the 10 experts, where every expert is a different color and line style. For example, here in the top left, you can see uh, this is all data that, were, that was left translated. And then you can see you know, at the beginning, the red one does better, like the red expert, I don't know, expert two does better, then it quickly goes down and then expert green emerges and he becomes the expert of this. And you can see this in the fact that the discriminator is completely or almost completely fooled by its output. And the same is happening for all the others and you see all the colors are different and styles are different. So this tells you that um, these experts uh, do seem to, these experts do th seem to fool the discriminator for different digits, which is a, which is a good thing. Okay, so now let's go back to the example I made at the very beginning. Let's say that you did train your MNIST classifier. And but by the way, do I have 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Uh, well, uh, it's up to you if you want to go up to 15 minutes. So okay, it's, it's I'll try, I'll, then I'll do, I'll do 12.30 if I can. Um, <laughs> cool. So, okay, so if inputs are at the top and outputs at the bottom, uh, one way you can we can check if this works well, you can take a pre-trained MNIST classifier, the one you you know learn in kindergarten. Now, if you just put the trans like the transform digits inside, as you can see, you get something like 40% accuracy. You know this was trained in very clean digits, so why should it work uh, so well? I mean, 40 is already pretty good. Now, if you were to use the ground truth, this would do 99%. So it's a, it's a good classifier. It's not a terrible one. And then if you take the opt from the model scored by the discriminator or VAE, you know your fitness model, then you see that. The more you train, the better the better it gets. Um, this is just to show that the experts at the beginning of training are not specialized. So this is who wins what. And you can see expert number five is the big winner. Um, it wins almost every single time for all kinds of categories. And then the more you train after you know a thousand iterations already, you can see that um, basically every expert, every expert has specialized in uh, one type of, of transformation. Now, what if you have too few or too many experts? We don't assume we actually know the number. In that case, you, uh, you know, we knew it was 10 and 10. But if we had chosen too few, like on the left, uh, you can see that some experts have to try to solve multiple tasks at once, which of course is not very good, because now if you need one or the other, you can't really choose. But you can always go for too many experts, which is what we did on the right. We took 16. And then you see that some lazy experts actually end up solving nothing. And then you can just... Uh, um, throw them in the bin, and then you keep the ones that learn something interesting. And you know, if a new tasks appear, maybe you can reuse one of the experts you didn't you didn't uh, use here. But you know, we haven't tested this. But in principle, you could reuse uh, experts that you haven't used before for new things. Okay, now now let's say let's do some more OOD test. Um, now let's take Omniglot and apply the same transformations that we applied earlier. So for example, let's take this first digit, this first uh, symbol. Now, if you apply expert zero, you see the color changes. This is nice. It looks like the expert was trained on MNIST, but it's still generalizing to, to Omniglot. It's funny, actually, if you try this expert on all the other digits, which it was actually never trained on, you know, if you think about this expert that changes color, this was mostly trained on, on black images. So it's interesting to see it, it behaves very consistently. Now let's look at the other experts. The other experts are doing what they learned, kind of. So, you know, you can see those are translation experts, and they are creating a black, black background omniglot symbol. So that's also cool. And here's the full um, matrix that shows what is happening to what. And yeah, everything looks pretty consistent. But this means we can try to go even one step further. So remember, we train everything on MNIST, and now we um, take omniglot. And you know, on MNIST, there was only one transformation at a time. It was either translation or conscious inversion or noise. Now we take Omniglot, so a new data set. We apply three transformations at once. So we change the color, we move the thing, we add some noise. Now, if we select out of the 10 experts the right ones, we can take the denoising expert first, then the contrast inversion expert. We change the color, 
than the downright translation expert. It censors it back. Now, if you compare it to the ground truth, it looks it looks pretty good considering we never try and never train on anything like this. Um, of course, we had to hand select which ones we wanted to use because we don't have we never seen Omniglot. We're not retraining anything here. But you know, in principle, if you had even a little bit of data, you could try to realign things uh, even with a small amount of it. Okay, some might complain canonical data might be scarce. Um, we actually tested how much of this you need. You actually need very little because you only need to realign distributions. Really, you don't you don't need to learn a perfect um, generator or anything like that. And that's actually pretty cheap. So with 64 examples, you could still reach 96% accuracy on the MNIST data set. And then um, concluding, um, interesting things to note that a straightforward single net baseline doesn't learn most mechanisms. This initializing the expert as identity uh, was key. Um, otherwise, some could overpower others. Um, and then training can be heavily parallelized across experts. That's a good thing if you if you have GPUs and so on. And for future work, it would be nice to allow multiple mechanisms simultaneously, which is what happens in practice, and then multiple passes through the experts, maybe with an RNN or RL. Of course, there are also limitations. It's, you know, it's expensive to compute N networks every time. And um, if you have multiple transformations, then trying all combinations gets exponentially bad. So it's probably not what you want to do. And also in practice, you know, MNIST is fun, but it's a bit toy. So if you could find something a bit more real, but then still with in the where the mechanisms are independent, it would be nice. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for the attention. Sorry, it took actually 15 minutes at the end. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much, uh, John Battista. You're a natural speaker, I would say. I really enjoy your talk. Uh, so there are a couple of questions in the chat, if you want to read them directly, or maybe I can read them to you. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we can answer uh, just both of them, and then we can move to the next presentation. Sure. Uh, okay, so one question is, do the experts share anything in common? Architecture weights? Uh, yeah, in this case, the experts have the all have the same architecture, and they're all trained, they're all initialized as the identity, but they don't share any weights. Now the question is, is there an intuition for why the experts work on Omniglot after being trained on MNIST? Yes, so my intuition is, you know, if you were to use one massive network to learn 10 different mechanisms, this network would have to learn inside a lot of weird switching mechanisms to reroute things inside in one way or another. If you do split things up, now every network is learning something very simple. Now you can afford having very small networks. And, you know, small networks are, the training on lots of data are more likely to generalize well because you know there's not huge models with that can have a crazy behavior it's actually pretty pretty simple so there is there's is a good chance that this will transfer well to something that's you know at the end not that different from from mnist great thanks again uh jim baptiste oh uh, yeah please go ahead um i i sorry i came in late uh i i um I came in when you, I think you mentioned something about Kolmogorov complexity. Yeah. Um, how, how I, I know that it's very difficult to use, at least that's my understanding. How yeah. did you use that? How did it come in here? Sorry, I came in late. Sure, of course. I mean, we, we don't really use it in practice. It's like an, kind of like an assumption we make or our, our motivation for this idea of competing experts. And basically, uh, we use this idea of com, um, conditional Kolmogorov complexity to define the independence of mechanisms. And then we say, if you put a lot of effort into learning how to do translation, this won't make you any better at learning how to do, say, color inversion, which means that you know the untrained expert that has never seen any data still has a very good chance, even though in terms of information, it has received much less exposure to data before. So it's, it's like the motivation behind the algorithm and the assumption behind the data generating process. Okay, uh, thank you. One one last question. Uh, you said that some experts learn two tasks. Mm -hmm. um, does it mean that they they learn but they don't perform equally well? Or if they do, what is so special about those experts? Because you would really like an expert who knows two things rather than one. Um, the thing is that if, if an expert knows two things, then for example, it becomes much harder to recompose it with other things, for example. Or you know, if you want to, if you have now more data about one of those two th things, if you have to retrain that expert completely, for example, you know, because of catastrophic forgetting and so on, you probably need to refetch all the data about the other task that the expert already knows to make sure he doesn't forget the other one. But if he just knows one thing, then you can just 
retrain that one on that one thing and you, you don't have this problem, for example. Mm. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons uh, behind, I would say, the, the work from uh, George, uh, right? Uh, the idea that you can compose uh, different things, different modules that do different things uh, in interesting ways. Uh, so that's why also, uh, let's say, uh, postpone the, the talk from George just after the one from Jean-Baptiste so that we can really gather this point. Uh, so thank you again, Jean-Baptiste, and please, uh, George, if you can share your screen and, and go at your talk. All right, thank you so much uh, for the intro. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, thanks. Great, all right. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Jorge Mendez. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. The work I'll be presenting today revolves around this idea of lifelong learning of compositional knowledge representations. And our key motivation, which I imagine we share with pretty much everyone here in this meetup, is to create intelligent systems that can understand the world and act on it to solve a multitude of different problems. Um, and in order to achieve this, we believe that artificial agents would require the ability to continually accumulate knowledge and build upon it as they learn to solve new tasks. Uh, and here's where, where this idea of composition comes in. If this knowledge is represented by some form of compositional structure, uh, then the agent could pick the relevant components for each task and combine them in different ways to achieve different goals. Uh, and so in, in this work, we created a general purpose framework for learning compositional structures. And the key idea we advocate for is separating the learning process into two stages. So as the learner faces each new task, it first uses only the existing components to assimilate the current task and then accommodates any newly obtained knowledge into the set of components. So it turns out that these two stages have connections to Piaget's theory of assimilation and accommodation stages of cognitive development. Uh, and to show the generality of the framework we created, we, we instantiated it into nine concrete algorithms with varying forms of compositional structures and base lifelong learning methods. And we evaluated them on eight data sets and demonstrated the benefits of this two-stage uh, process. Qualitatively, we also found that the components that are learned by our framework are self-contained and reusable across multiple tasks. To put this in a little bit of context, most recent work in lifelong learning has primarily focused on avoiding catastrophic forgetting over a sequence of tasks, but it hasn't put a lot of effort into finding knowledge structures that can be reused across the different tasks. In contrast, uh, compositional learning methods seek to extract the compositional structure that relates to multiple tasks, uh, but they are typically trained in a batch multitask setting with all the data available simultaneously. So this is, to our knowledge, the first in-depth study of methods to combine these two lines of work. So let's start by going over our problem formulation. The agent will be faced with a sequence of tasks. Each of them will require learning a prediction function f parameterized by some vector theta. And the goal of the agent will be to find parameters that optimize the cost across all, all the tasks it encounters. And to do this, it should be able to reuse existing knowledge to achieve transfer and store any newly discovered knowledge for future reuse. Uh, and of course, during this process, the agent should avoid catastrophic forgetting about how to solve the earlier tasks that it encountered during training. So more concretely, the learner will accumulate knowledge into a set of modules that are common to all tasks, and it will choose how to combine those modules to solve the current task, potentially in a way that depends on the current input point X. And so a simple example of this type of composition is factored linear models. So imagine we want each task's model to be a simple linear function with these parameters. Then we can store knowledge into a dictionary of linear factors and combine them via some task-specific coefficients to select the relevant components to construct the current task's model. A somewhat more complex example is soft layer ordering for deep nets. Our goal here is to create a task-specific deep net, and we will do this based on our repository of shared neural net layers. So the input will be passed through all the shared layers, and then at the first depth, a task-specific selection vector, ST, will 
choose which layer's output to pass to the next layer. Uh, and then this process is repeated at multiple depths, effectively reordering the layers in the repository to create a new network for the current task. Uh, another way to reorder layers is by considering a different ordering for each input point. So instead of having a fixed selection vector at each depth, like in the previous example, the agent can take the current input, pass it through a gating network, and take the output of this gating network to select which layer's output to pass to the next layer. And again, this process is repeated at multiple depths. Now, with this model, we can get if we get a new input point, the gating nets will order the layers in some new input-specific configuration, specializing the network architecture to the current input. The framework that we created can be adapted to handle each of these examples of compositional structures. At a very high level, our framework is split into four steps. First off, in order for the components to be maximally useful, they should be reusable across multiple tasks and also across different configurations within each task, like, for example, at different depths in a deep net. So to initialize our mod modules, we keep the data for the first few tasks that the agent encounters and train all those jointly, uh, manually fixing the way the components are combined to some random structure that reuses components both across tasks and across configurations to encourage them to have this type of reusability. Um, then for every subsequent task, the agent will split the learning process into an assimilation and an accommodation stage. So during the first stage of assimilation, the learner will attempt to solve the new task by just learning how to combine the existing components learned up to the previous tasks without making any modifications to the components. Uh, this is fundamentally different from most current approaches to lifelong learning, which train entire models end to end, potentially damaging existing knowledge before even acquiring any understanding of the current task. This is also similar to the way humans learn to handle new situations, according to Piaget and theory, by just trying to use our existing knowledge to understand what is happening. In practice, this step involves optimizing the selection over the modules, which we can do via backpropagation in the example structures that use soft module selection, or we can use other approximations like reinforce if we want to do hard module selection instead. So it is very unlikely that the existing components were perfect to start with, like this brown puzzle piece here, which should have been orange. And so after the agent has assimilated the current task, it then accommodates any newly acquired knowledge by adapting the components selected for the current task. So this is the first step that could cause forgetting, since modifying the shared components affects the model of the previous tasks. So here we employ existing lifelong learning approaches like Experience Replay or EWC in order to avoid forgetting. Another possibility is that the existing components are just not sufficient to solve the current task, like this case where we need a pink puzzle piece that we have never seen before. Uh, so to fully accommodate new knowledge, it might be necessary to create new components. And we achieve this with a technique we call component dropout. So the idea here is that we only want to add a new component if it substantially affects performance. But to gauge the impact of the new component in performance, we need to be able to compare the model that, ha that has access to the new component to the model that doesn't. But training these two separate models naively would lead to a large memory use. On the other hand, it is known that dropout enables learning multiple models reusing the same set of parameters. So we exploit this idea by deterministically alternating training with and without the new module on the same set of shared parameters. This enables us to compare the performance of both models without the need to store each model explicitly. So to test the generality and effectiveness of our framework, we evaluated the three examples of compositional structures described earlier, linear factorization, soft layer ordering, and soft gating, combined with various existing lifelong algorithms. In the interest of time, I'll focus only on the results obtained with soft layer ordering, but I'm happy to answer any questions about remaining results if we have time, or you can look them up directly in the paper and reach out with questions. 
So as base lifelong methods for the adaptation step, we used experience replay, elastic weight consolidation, naively fine tuning on the current task, and freezing modules after initialization. For each of them, we trained the full version of our framework with dynamically added components and a simpler version that keeps a fixed size set of modules. As baselines, we compared against jointly optimizing the modules and selection and training an equ equivalent uh, monolithic model with no components. We tested these methods on lifelong variants of MNIST, Fashion MNIST, CUB, CIFAR 100, and Omniglot, and showed essentially that our methods achieve higher accuracy than the baselines, especially when using the full version of our framework with dynamic uh, component addition. So to analyze these results in a bit more depth, we looked at the learning curves averaged across MNIST and Fashion MNIST when using experience replay. So each curve here corresponds to one task trained during 100 epochs and then evaluated continually thereafter. On the top left, we see our full method with dynamic module addition. The first 99 epochs show the assimilation process and the 100th epoch where we see this big jump in performance is the accommodation of new knowledge into the set of existing components. Now, note how this incorporation of new knowledge causes no noticeable drop in performance on the earlier tasks, even though we are modifying the components they used. We also see a trend of increasing assimilation performance, uh, showing that the components become better able to generalize to unseen tasks over time. Finally, being able to learn nearly perfectly uh, the final task without any adaptation of the components. And in contrast, the joint and no components baselines get progressively degrading performance as the agent learns more tasks. All right, so, so while it's great to be able to improve performance, we thought that these results were incomplete without some understanding of what the components were learning to do. To get a sense of this, we ran a generative visual experiment where the agent learns to reconstruct images of the digit four. Uh, each image is a task, and each pixel in the image is an input point, with the x, y coordinates as, in, uh, as features and the pixel intensity as the label. In this experiment, we were interested in understanding the behavior of components and not in generalization to unseen data, so we use all the data for training. Um, so to visually inspect the effect of each learned component, we increase the intensity with which that component is selected across various depths from left to right uh, and across different tasks, top and bottom. And so for, for this particular component uh, that we're showing here, uh, we see that the one learned by our method, uh, as we increase the intensity from left to right, we see that the lines of the digit become thinner, uh, completely disappearing at the shallowest layers, but only becoming slightly sharper at the deepest layers. And this is consistent across tasks. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the jointly trained baseline exhibits no consistent behavior that we were able to find. So to recap, we created a generic framework for lifelong learning of compositional structures, uh, where the learning process is separated into an assimilation stage in which the, learn, the, lear, the learner figures out how to combine existing components and an accommodation stage where the learner modifies the components to incorporate new knowledge. We mentioned that these stages loosely follow Piaget's theories of intellectual development, and we evaluated nine instantiations of our framework on eight different data sets, uh, finding that they achieve improved performance. Qualitatively, we showed that the learned components are self-contained and reusable, capturing knowledge that enables the agent to quickly learn new unseen tasks. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions if there is time or offline via email uh, otherwise. Thank you so much, George, for your great presentation. I really love this work. As you said, uh, one of the first in his kinds uh, trying to uh, move it to, towards like uh, structural learning uh, and, and, and reusable components uh, for continual learning. Uh, so do we have uh, a quick question for George or, or from the audience? Otherwise, I will add uh, one quick. So just one quick question, uh, George. So uh, at the moment, I, I don't know if you if you said that, but uh, 
Uh, with this uh, approach, are you able to learn uh, several components within the same task, within the same batch of data, or you just learn one component? Um, so, so for each task, you you might learn several uh, components, so not necessarily a single one. What we do uh, limit is the amount of new components that can be added. So if we already have five or six components, um, the new task will try to reuse all those five or six, plus only a single new one, because we want it to limit the amount of new modules that, that are created over time. I mean, in principle, you could just simply add various uh, new modules, uh, but then that would just increase the complexity of, of things. We found that at least for, for these example data sets, it was sufficient to add a single one at most. Yeah. So e mo most tasks don't, don't even end up adding any new modules and just reuse the existing ones. Because you, uh, differently from what we heard from Gian Battista, you don't force uh, essentially doing training this model to be different somehow, to, to learn different things. Yes, so and, and that's that's a very good point. And, and I, I do believe that eventually, in order for this to be really useful, we should probably use some sort of independence uh, or sparsity uh, regularization. Uh, but we didn't do any of that uh, in, in this current work. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, George. I think that now we can uh, directly move to the last spotlight presentation from Kaylan. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Um, so hi, everyone. Awesome, awesome talks so far. Glad to be here. Um, so mine will be a bit different, obviously, because uh, I'm primarily a neuroscientist and who dabbles in AI stuff on the side. Um, and so a bit disclaimer about the talk. Um, Think of this as pretty much a partial review of the field, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that we're doing that relates to the topic. And the reason for this is simple. If I just talked about my stuff, I don't think that would give you a clear enough um, idea. And my, my motivation is just to give you some examples from the cognitive science and neuroscience literature to maybe spark some ideas in your own algorithms um, and at least have some sort of healthy discussion afterwards. Um, but again, this will only be the tip of the iceberg of a literature that you'll see is half a century long. And so there's a lot to get through. Um, the in, in general, in the cognitive science literature, the generalization dates back like I said, almost a century really to maybe Bartlett. Um, but since uh, it's been shown to be uh, that generalization capabilities are across multiple species from rodents, birds to monkeys, and obviously us to some degree. Um, and it starts early. So some of my favorite examples of generalization are when children first learn words, um, the plurality of words. Um, say you teach a kid that one dog is dog, but two dogs is dogs, so they'll instantly um, or very, very shortly after start to apply that to other animals. So if you say one cat is cat, they can guess that multiple cats would be cats. But I, I think an important point to discern is that, that the benchmark that we might have set for ourselves is, isn't as high as it, you might think, um, mostly in, in the sense that we are not as good as generalization as we might think. Um, and to kind of show the point that we've known this for a really long time, say these are some old citations, and to be honest, they can go older, um, but there's recent work that basically proves the same point. Um, I won't go into all of these, but one example is in the middle. Um, in infants and toddlers, so like six months old, um, you can teach a, a baby an action just by visual learning. So if I, I have something in my hand and I can commit some action from it, they can do it one shot learning and they can replicate the action right away. Um, however, this doesn't generalize when the object is changed. And if you look over development stages, um, you can see at like six and 12 months of age, um, a small change in the object um, will completely disrupt that one shot learning. But at 18 months, the small change, they'll still be able to generalize. Um, larger changes to the object will disrupt the 18 month old, but not a 21 month old. So there's some learning component. Um, at least to this generalization in humans, um, that seems to be uh, an interesting place to look. Uh, also, it's not just infants, it's adults too. There's a famous New Orleans Diamond study um, where the Tower Hanoi puzzle, um, where adults will learn the solution to the puzzle to completion, but if you give them the, the same puzzle, but with different shapes of pieces, um, but it would still take the same algorithm and same steps to solve, um, adults won't generalize to that. And there's 
a context-driven recall where uh, your learning is drastically improved by um, being in the same context or the same room or the same place, um, and it might not generalize as well across temporal contexts. So the benchmark might not be as hard um, to, to set as we want, but humans can still obviously generalize, and so it's important to try and understand at least a little bit about how this might be. And again, to summarize um, half a century of, of, of the literature on this, um, the, the categorization and journalization literature in cognitive science tends to come down to, to two main theories that have been fighting each other for, for a while. Um, and they are the exemplar theory and the prototype theory. Uh, in short, it's basically, does the brain store some number of recent examples when you make a decision or generalization and then you compare the new item to them? Or do you store prototype generalization um, over some distribution of your past experiences? So you've seen a number of dogs in your life. Do you store the individual experiences of each dog? Or do you draw some generalized abstract representation of dog to compare um, a new animal to when you see it to make the decision, is this a dog or is this not a dog? And do all the knowledge that I already have apply to this novel uh, animal that I see? So we can look in the brain and try and see this. In 2013, Mac did. Um, in their study, they had a, the quintessential study um, to, to, to basically train participants to categorize two different items in the lab. Um, and then eventually they put them in an fMRI scanner and they scanned them. And then they looked at the data and they had both the prototype computational model and the exemplar computational model. And they compared the data to each of those to see which one that the brain might go about doing. And lo and behold, it comes out that in their study that the exemplar model, where you compare a new item when you're trying to generalize towards it um, to the a subset of previous examples that you've experienced um, with a subset of brain regions in this, what we could call exemplar network, including the parietal lobe, which is in like the top of your head and the right lateral prefrontal cortex right in the front. But that's not the whole story. Uh, a couple years ago, um, a challenge to that, that model was eventually put put out um, under the assumption that the, the task constraints that Mac, and Mac et al. had used was, was too constrained. And so they used a, a more general task with, with more distinct categories. And they contradicted the, the results that Mac had shown with a new um, finding that the prototype model in their, their study was more so supported so that in this case, the brain does abstract over some sample distribution of the, the previous experiences that it had received. And interestingly, when, when they went about doing this, they found a new network of brain regions that seemed to abstract over, over the prototype theory. And so this would be, um, you could say, the abstraction network, including the hippocampus, which um, informs a lot of the models that, that we have today, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, so a different part of the prefrontal cortex. Um, they actually followed this up last year um, to kind of answer the question of why does the brain need two different networks? Um, and they've shown that it's dependent upon the task constraints, so how the, the person is trained given the the, the specific task constraints will bias them to either use one network or the other in the brain to bias towards an abstraction over the previous samples that have been experienced or to take some sample of each of those experiences and then compare the new item to that. We can dive in further. So the prefrontal cortex was implicated in both studies. And so if we wanna see what's the neural representation doing, um, uh, what's it all in 2018 uh, actually recorded directly from the brain in monkeys. Um, they performed again the same categorization task. You have two main um, categories and you have varied exemplars of each. So you could say cats versus dogs, but in this case it was more abstract dots so the monkeys could be able to do the task. Um, and critically they vary the abstraction level between the exemplars, um, between each of the individual uh, items that the monkey had seen. Um, and I won't get into all the details, but they get hairy. But the point of the study was that the prefrontal cortex, just that region, um, dissociates between these two schemes, where 
the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex seems to be doing this sensory matching where you don't necessarily need an abstraction to make your decision. You can just compare it to some of the more recent items that you had seen. Um, but also there's another part of the uh, prefrontal cortex which does serve this more abstraction and generalization function um, that abstracts over the previously seen items and can make a generalization from there. And interestingly, in, in neural terms, um, these were each associated with a specific oscillation um, to kind of mark their, their different communication patterns. Uh, in, in their case, critically, beta oscillations were important for generalization and abstraction. Um, and like I said, there's a lot, and those were just two really brief examples. Um, but some of the other ideas that might be useful to, to think about in, in the back of your head and from kind of this prototype versus exemplar debate is that coherent sets of data in humans, so when humans are trying to make these categorization tasks and generalization tasks, um, that coherent sets of items, so items that are similar to each other, um, seem to be more efficient to learn, but the more varied the, the, the items are, so if I don't know if you're taking an MNIST example, the more you kind of manipulate the MNIST images um, away from the, the standard one, two, three, four, um, you get better generalization. Um, so having more examples, when you sample from the entire space, um, even in humans, you're going to get a better generalization. And this has been known for years. Um, and interestingly, prototypes, so to form this abstraction in humans tends to require more samples. Um, you need more training to, to abstract over data, whereas exemplar, you can just use whatever last few salient memories you have. Um, and more recent work has looked at specialized and abstract representations in the time course of when they form, and actually you, you find that um, they're forming simultaneously. So it's not like you, you form, like you keep these salient examples to compare to, or you abstract over them, but you, you, your brain seems to be doing both. Um, and a whole other topic, which is really related to the first talk that we heard uh, of replay and consolidation may lend to generalization. Um, and that could be a whole other talk, but unfortunately, I don't have time for it. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of the stuff I do, and it's related to, you might know who tweeted this out about continual learning and sequence learning, about being two sides of the same coin. Um, and this is very true. If you go back to some of the original catastrophic interference papers from Mikasa and Cohen, it's defined as just that, the sequen sequential learning problem. Um, and so that's what I study in the lab. Uh, we study how animals in the brain represent sequences of information. Um, so very briefly, we take an animal, a rat, and they are exposed to a sequence of odors, distinct odors, and they have to identify whether um, the, the odor is in the sequence or out sequence just as a proxy so we know they know the sequence. And then later on, we can take the, that train sequence that they had learned and we can change the odors um, and see how well they can do in this, uh, the task with a new sequence. Um, so we can kind of take the task from two different standpoints, the sequential learning from within the one sequence and sequential learning between different sequences of odors. And to try and get some proxy of what the brain is doing, we record from the hippocampus. Um, which you can see in green um, over on the right. So um, kind of brief results from just the generalization aspect of our studies. Um, the, you, we have a sequence memory index, but you can basically think of it as how well does the animal do with the task? Um, and when they're well-trained, they obviously do very well. And when they're exposed to a new sequence of odors that they haven't seen before, um, their performance drops quite a bit. But with time and training, um, the second session, novel two, um, their performance goes back up. Um, and what's interesting about this and what we kind of see in humans is it takes a long time to train them on that first task, that first set of sequences, their rodents, and it's hard for them to be able to identify, yes, this is the sequence, or no, this isn't the sequence. Um, but once they, once they get that out of the way and we give them a new sequence, they actually learn pretty fast um, within a couple sessions. And so this is really interesting in terms of like a learning set or, or how quickly you can learn once you have information stored. Um, when we record from the neurons and we record from the brain, the brain tracks the novelty of the sequence. So um, when the, the animal knows the sequence well, there's cells that represent it. But when it's given a new sequence, the cells don't necessarily represent it as much. But with learning, these come online. Um, and um, kind of relating back to the monkey study I told you earlier, 
uh, we too see that beta oscillations do seem to track um, how well the animals have learned the sequence, which you can see on the right, um, where the, the power, so how much of these oscillations do you see, increases with how well the animals know the sequence that they're experiencing. So that was a lot, and hopefully it'll spark at least some ideas or maybe uh, further discussion. Um, if you have any questions or comments or want any pointers to literature or anything, my information's up at the top. Please feel free to reach out and happy to answer any questions with the time we have left. Thanks. All uh, right. Uh, thank you, Kaylin. Uh, I always think that we are so lucky to have a neuroscientist uh, among us. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, now we can have like one or two uh, specific questions to this talk. Uh, if someone in the audience is willing to, to have, um, have a question for, for Kaylin, uh, you can ask him now. Um, I, have, I have a question for Kaylin. Um, I thought what you said about learning a representation that generalizes well leads to fast learning um, to be really interesting because in machine learning these days there's a lot of work on explicitly uh, training models to learn fast but I'm starting to suspect and I think many people are starting to suspect that um, really the, the the parallels between getting a representation such that you're able to learn tasks fast subsequently, getting a representation that generalizes well to other tasks, and just getting features which are as good for as many tasks as possible. These things are very, very similar. Um, yeah, I wondered I wondered if you have any 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 thoughts about that. Yeah. Um there's there's a, there's a lot uh, and so any any time you talk about the brain there's a thousand examples that will touch on every aspect of it being true or not um, I, I mean generally the the way I think about it at least is that the at least in humans and the vast majority of tasks that humans do we are constantly leveraging the the past representations that we have um, like for example, if, uh, I mean, I guess most of us are developers here. When you're writing code, you're leveraging the, the past knowledge that you have of uh, what's a function, what's a for loop, what's an if statement, right? These are things that you previously learned and you're taking these learned representations that you already have and you're assembling them together. Um, but again, in a continual learning fashion, these representations that you learned build over time. So you, had to learn at some point how to use a computer and how to learn to use a keyboard and you had to learn how to use language and you had to learn how to use read right so so to do these complex tasks you you're using and you're leveraging these learned representations that you already have yeah. um, in such a way that once you have them it's much easier to assemble them together uh, into some, some coherent functionalized task yes um, I mean, what, what's really interesting is that the, the thing is, if I think about standard feed forward artificial neural networks, isn't that sort of what they're doing implicitly already, right? As in, there are, um, there's information about the, the past samples that you've, uh, you've trained on in the weights. And then when you do the forward pass, when you do inference, um, it implicates that stored memory. So it's using the, the, the representation that you, you've learned before. And of course, you have mechanisms um, such as neurons not activating or neurons activating uh, um, very strongly, um, which implicitly sort of decide which parts of the representation are relevant for the current input and which parts are not. So what's really confusing is what's missing? Because a lot of these properties that we talk about um, you know, transfer and and making use of of learned uh, representations. It's going on already implicitly, even in 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 basic um, uh, training training mechanisms for artificial networks. But 
obviously artificial networks are still nowhere near as 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 um intelligent as as humans are so yeah that, that's just no, 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 uh, I, I, an observation I yeah i see your point and i mean I, I don't think anybody knows that i don't think neuroscience knows the answer yet mm -hmm. I mean, if we did then you know we would have machines that could do it um but my guess is that it the the distinction lies in uh, my my point that I was making earlier is that there's a distinction between learning a representation and then leveraging those representations to form more, I guess, more complex representations. I mean, I guess the way to think about it is how how often are the representations that you're learning, say in the neural network, uh, actively being used to solve other problems? I mean, I, I guess this is kind of the quintessential goal of transfer learning, where you take whatever representation you have and you apply it to some new problem. Um, but but we know that we do this all the time. It is a necessity to do this all the time. Um, I mean, you leverage things that you learned as a kid every single day and you built upon them and you don't have to retrain or think about them ever again. I mean, once you learned how to talk and you learned language and once you learned language, you learned how to write. And once you learned how to write, you learned how to make compositions and it builds and builds and builds. Um, but I, I, I think at least in neural networks, we're getting closer to learning how to form the representations themselves and form coherent and robust representations that can abstract over the statistical distribution of whatever data that you're given. Um, but I, I personally think that the, the next level will be um, how do we implicitly use those within the network um, to kind of aid future learning and to, to kind of catalyze future learning um, such that it, it's not basically just learning the statistical distribution of representations, um, but more so um, kind of building these kind of knowledge networks um, that new information can be assimilated into um, rather than retraining everything from scratch. I, I didn't touch on it, but the way it, there's, there's something called schema theory that you may or may not have heard of before. And it's just the idea that you kind of form these generalization, like, um, uh, what's the word? Like a script. Like, you know, when you go to a restaurant that there's a high probability that the waiter is going to ask for your drink, then you're going to get your food, then you're going to get dessert, then you're going to get a bill. Uh, it generalizes across restaurants. Um, and, and that's something that the brain learns and uses. Um, and th this could be used for anything. You know that when I give a talk, I'm going to have a title and then I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I did and then I'm going to have a conclusion yeah. because you had that distribution of experience. But yeah, I mean, what you're describing now is just a prediction task, right? I mean, um, uh, that, that, that sort of form, it, it fits everything that we try to do with, with, with neural networks. Um, uh, Every objective is 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 a predictive objective, um, and what you described is, is also a predictive a predictive task. <laughs> is, is, yeah. yeah, but I mean, I mean, effectively, that's what the brain is doing. I mean, at every at every step of the the path. I mean, there's. I mean, even parts of your eye, parts of your retina are predictive at the lowest level of of sensory. Um, um, interaction, it, it's starting to try and predict whatever the next input will be. And those only get more abstract as you go up the hierarchy from like retina to visual cortex, from visual cortex to hippocampus. Um, and so the, there's a strong component there, I'm sure, that that, that the brain is doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, yeah, we can maybe talk more later or offline or something so, so other people have questions and I can kind of get more down to, to the details of the question you're asking. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, guys. And uh, this concludes the first part of the meetup. Uh, we're a bit late, uh, so we're going to keep it short for the next uh, few minutes, uh, the discussion. But uh, before doing that, I just wanted to uh, tell the audience that uh, uh, if the speakers agree, uh, they will be able to find the slides of their talks um, in the continual AI forum topic that you can find on the chat. Uh, and uh, essentially there you will be able, you speakers will be able to post uh, a link to your slides that you can upload on your personal uh, Google Drive or no, uh, um, um, let's say uh, place where you, you want to store your, your slides. Uh, 
All right, uh, so let's move to the second part of the meetup where uh, I've heard a few questions, but of course, uh, for all the people that, that are still here, uh, if you want, you can ask your question through the chat and then I will uh, ask the question and read the question from this, the chat to for the, our speakers to answer it. And for anyone, actually, anyone can uh, answer and give uh, his or her idea about a particular question. So it's an open debate, but uh, I wanted to hear the ideas from our speakers first. All right, so let's start with the first question that uh, summarizes maybe uh, the main topic of the meetup. So what uh, does robustness mean for you? So what does it mean for continual learning? And uh, how robustness is linked to generalization? So any of you uh, can answer that, or all of you, if you want. So the idea again, the question is, uh, um, what 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 does it mean robustness uh, in continual learning for you, and how do you think this is related to to generalization, or if it, if it is related <laughs> to generalization. Okay, I'll, I'll bite. Um, so I think I think in this context uh, we can get a lot about you know especially in this in this context of of continual or lifelong learning we can get a lot of a sense a good sense of what robustness should be from Jan Battista's talk where you know you you learn these modules they they're supposed to do something and they're capable of doing it in in a wide diversity of contexts, right? You can change the data set, you can change the distribution, but that particular module does what it's supposed to do. It does one thing, it does it well, and it generalizes. I think that's 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 probably what I would interpret as robustness, especially in this setting. And and I think it's it's definitely something that we need to focus a lot on. Like how do what what is the right knowledge representation that we can use so that we can replicate what we learn in one in one task one distribution or one time step and reuse it later when things change when there's a shift over time in the distribution or when we are facing a different task that shares some common uh underlying structure i i think that yeah that summarizes my my view of it i think thanks anyone else uh wants to add something Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say something, but I, I don't know if it makes much sense. I, I should maybe say first, I'm not an expert in continual learning by by any means. Um, but I think to me, what's one of the things that's most interesting is to think about, like, why do some memories stay and why do others disappear? For example, I often think about, yeah, I mean, I, I clearly remember my uh, date of birth. I don't have to retrieve very often, but it's really there. I did retreat a few times in my life when I have to tell it to someone and so on. And then there are these other events like, I mean, I guess this mostly applies to, maybe to Americans, like this thing, like, do you remember where you were when you heard about the, the Twin Towers uh, thing? And that's also the kind of thing you, it feels like you don't at least actively think about it often, but it's still there. I mean, even I remember now I was, I, I was young and you know, I'm Italian. It's, it's not, it didn't affect me as much as um, Americans, I guess, but I don't know. It, it feels like maybe to me the most interesting question is how does um, how does the brain end up ends up uh, segregating knowledge in different parts and maybe make sure not to overwrite. I wonder. I don't know if you have a if you have a network that's big enough, is it enough to have something like a hash function that just decides you know based on the input I just go and write something in this part of the brain, and then you know unless the input is very similar, I'm not going to go and and overwrite in there. Um, yeah, basically, I'm very confused. I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a, I love the problem. I, I don't really have any, any good answer. Well, it, it makes sense. Uh, your, your comment. Uh, Guido and Kaelin, do you have something to add? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I study memory, and so I, I also think a lot about it, and I, I think it's amazing. Um, but there's there's a lot of aspects of memory too that I, I I mean the distinction between the brain and say like a camera and like a photograph is that that 
we all know that we remember a very small percentage of the actual experience that we have, like a very, very small, right? Like if I took a video of, of like this talk, for example, the amount of information that it would maintain is much greater than the information that um, I myself would remember and keep in my memory. Um, and that's only going to decrease over time. And we can prove this where if I tested all 23 people here at the end, it, regular intervals and I said could you just go through your memory and tell me how much you remembered from these talks I mean unfortunately it's not going to be very much and it's going to be variable and it's probably going to be contentious upon whatever prior learning you have um, and so there's a couple points in there that I think are important um, one is that our memories I think and, and what the data has shown are very very contentious to these kind of knowledge structures that we have already built um, Throughout, 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 your brain is lazy. Uh, your brain wants to do as minimal amount of work as it possibly can. And so if it can kind of fit some new information into the structure that already has, it's going to try. Um, another clever trick that, that is kind of recent within like the last 10 years, but it's becoming more and more pervasive in the literature is, is kind of this idea that a lot of your memory is reconstructive, that the memory, so the 9-11 example is a good one because there's been a lot of studies on that about whether or not people really do remember 9-11 as clearly as they think um, if you're in the U.S. or the States, although I know everyone around the world usually heard of it. Um, and there's studies that show a lot of the 9-11 memories that we think are, are very of, um, among the most clear that we have and possess um, are primarily reconstructions. And there's a lot of factual inaccuracies in them. Um, which, I mean, clever psychologists have went back to like prove to people that your memory is false um, and, and they're not as, as clear as, as you might think that they would be. And so I think when you put all that together, um, your brain takes a lot of heuristics and shortcuts to kind of create this, this huge knowledge web where it, it uses the pre-existing knowledge structures that you've worked really hard to learn, which are slow to learn and take a while to learn. But once you have them, they're really useful, um, filters out a lot of the noise and then fills in the gaps by kind of reconstructing based on kind of those two things. Um, and then that, that's how you get a, a lot of the information that you see. But, but again, that's, I mean, everything I say is a lie because the, there's always a counterexample. And to be honest, we really don't know. But that seems to be the direction where things are pointing. So we can summarize uh, the idea that uh, essentially what you see as robustness in computer learning is essentially remember the things that are important uh, for, for, for going into life and solving tasks. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, what I what what I all, always wonder, and and it's uh, about the next question I'm going to ask you, is um, uh, but much of the research that we carry out in in continual learning now nowadays, uh, I mean we we just measure the accuracy on the test set as a proxy of a good generalization, right? Uh, but uh, is it really true or we are just, for example, staking, uh, just accumulating knowledge without really generalizing to situations and, and you know, distributions we've never encountered before? For example, let's say that uh, in, in a continual learning scenario, I, I learned to recognize green apples. Then I move to, you know, I go on and I learn how to recognize red apples. Uh, then I would expect uh, to be able, as I encounter a uh, yellow apple, to recognize it, right? If I have generalized the concept of an apple. But it we, it's possible also that we are just accumulating the knowledge of uh, green and red apples. And we are just, uh, I mean, this knowledge is biased somehow. It, like, just, we are able to recognize them but just because we have uh, mapped, for example, the color instead of the shape of, of the apple, right? And uh, in the end, we are not able, even though the accuracy is, uh, is, uh, is very high, because we are able to recognize all the kinds of apples, we are not actually learning general and robust representations over time. Do you think this is a problem for today, continual learning, for the future of continual learning? What, what are your ideas about this?
Um, so maybe I can I can reply to that or I can start by replying to that. So yeah, I, I do think it's yeah it's it's a problem in some sense, and it, it's definitely a, a difference from from how humans um, how humans learn. Um, but what I thought was was very interesting from 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 Kylan's talk, um, where he gave examples that that actually also humans are are not as good in generalization as we might think. Um, but kind of what what I took from there is that generalization in some sense is a bit arbitrary, right? Like, okay, what is good generalization? Um, I think in, indeed the, the, the example you gave with the apples, okay, if you've got green apples and red apples, then like most humans will agree, okay, like you should generalize that to yellow apples. But, but yeah, I, th I think there is some degree, at least at, at, at some point there, there becomes some degree of, of um, of arbitrariness um, of, of what what is good generalization and what's not. Um. That's a very good point. <laughs> uh, anyone else who's willing to add something on this? But isn't it just um, uh, your ability to um, uh, well, I mean, I, I, so for me, I, I, I'm kind of confused um, when you ask that question, Vicenzo, because I think, in fact, generalization can be defined as um, minimal loss or equivalently maximal re reward um, on some unseen data. Um, of course, you can choose the data in such a way that it doesn't mean anything, like it... Um, uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, in your Apple's example, your test data is just like slightly different green apples. Um, exactly, yeah. Then, yes, then, of course, you can show that you generalize to those apples, but it's not meaningful generalization. Um, of course, uh, what we really want is abstract generalization, right? Um, like we want the network to learn abstract rules um, uh, which can then be applied successfully to data that superficially looks very different um, and, and still be able to capture the reward um, in that situation. Uh, so I think basically to, answer, to reply to Guido's point that um, if you have an established reward uh, objective in your test scenario, then generalization is very well defined, like it's not arbitrary. But the way that you define that reward structure may be nonsensical. Like it might not actually might not actually demonstrate anything meaningful. Um, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's a good point. It 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 is indeed um, it's possible and and probably very important when you talk about or when you study generalization to indeed um like really clearly define it and and, and test for it um yeah okay. maybe i can yeah. share, share my thoughts on on generalizations just just to just to chime in um so when i think of generalizations i, I think i have like definitely two concrete notions of generalizations that i think are well defined and interesting okay okay let's let's forget about the iad generalization maybe that's that's maybe too already well defined and standard so let's talk about kind of like all oh, generalization and the two things I think of that to me make sense one is uh, compositional generalization and the other one is in uh, generalization in terms of invariances so compositional generalization is a little bit like what also like George talked about you say you know a new task a new apple a new something it has all kinds of elements that I've seen already before I haven't seen them in this specific combination you know there are exponentially many combinations of <clears throat> some categorical factors I have. I can't expect to see all of them. It doesn't matter. I've learned to recognize them all independently, so now I can recombine them together. So perhaps my training support is very small, and uh, you know the test one is huge, and I think it's completely well-defined, makes a lot of sense. I would say generally maybe not completely solved, but some things uh, start to show some, some of these uh, properties, especially if you're training on lots of data where lots of combinations are already present. And I think the other generalization notion that makes sense to me is um, in terms of invariances, where you say you you observe data in different scenarios, and there's there are some invariant factors, 
And these invariant factors might not be the easiest way of learning about this uh, the data. There are always some spurious factors as well. And you might learn the invariant one, then you will do well on other distributions that um, have the same property, the same invariances inside. Or you might do the lazy thing and perhaps just memorize this data and then um, learn to rely on these spurious factors. And once you go out of distribution, the spurious factors are not there and then you then you don't know what to do anymore. And I think these are maybe the two more like technical definitions of generalization that I, out of OOD generalization I'm very interested in. And then I think out of that, more in general, we often feel like, yeah, there are tasks where we just want like, well, why doesn't this generalize? And then it just feels to me that we're just saying, why doesn't it do what the, what a human do? And then I feel like very often we're being also somewhat unfair to many of these algorithms. We always think, oh, you know, but I've trained this, you know, this this network was trained on image nets, like a million images. And my my nephew, he's like one year old, he's seen two dogs, he recognizes all of them. I think this is this is completely unfair to these algorithms. I think my nephew through his uh, through his I don't know millions of years of evolutions and uh, and all of his uh, parents and relatives who, who managed to survive or not, well, those who could survive are the ones who had very good structures to recognize dogs and, you know, his brain already has plenty of distractions inside. So all in all, my nephew has already seen millions of dogs, I've had tens of millions of dogs probably, not with his own eyes, that the eyes are traveling back in time. And I think the training we do with neural networks is much more, it's much closer to the one we do with evolution. So I think sometimes also just expecting this kind of generalization from networks that are trained with very small amount of data it just feels a bit unfair and unless you can really put all that structure in there then we shouldn't even expect it and when we do train with lots of data then we can we do start to see things that are very interesting and and show these signs i think on a gpt3 for me is a good example of you know showing some sort of generalization to tasks they wasn't trained on i think gpt3 ultimately is just trained to do one thing then you take the same representation and you can do lots of lots of other things you wasn't trained for so yeah just just my my two cents on generalization <laughs> that was great. Jabatista, thanks for your, your vision on this. Um, uh, anyone else from the audience also has something to add about this point or previous points as well? Uh, feel free to join the discussion, of course. Hi, Irina. Hi. Oh, uh, sorry. I was uh, actually giving my own talk, so I had to miss part of the very interesting previous talk. But well, at least I read the paper. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, it's very interesting recent work that we're discussing by email on um, yeah, um, ICL criteria and explanations that are hard to vary, which is relevant to this discussion. But I, I really wanted to kind of second what um, just said about the unfairness of comparison of uh, like few short generalization uh, that usually is a, kind of brought as an example in kids. And indeed, precisely what I would say that they have advantage of having the model encoding effectively uh, yeah, millions and millions of samples seen previously by their um, uh, ancestors of that particular network. And indeed, yes, GPT-3 shows quite impressive results, but then, yeah, indeed, the question is, like, in which way you think it's better to kind of proceed? Because one way is, and one argument is, I mean, you try to really boost the amount of compute and amount of data available to infinity and try to kind of train those models, but it kind of assumes that they're being trained in classical sense with all the data available, or you rather consider evolutionary approaches that essentially getting at the same scale in terms of data and in terms of compute and perhaps in terms of model size, if you allow for evolutionary expansion of your model, but they just do it in time. And that's exactly where continual learning comes in. And the good question is like whether sh you should uh, invest into approaches like OpenAI of just boosting compute, well, if you have enough money to do that, and uh, data sets being collected and doing it this way, or you essentially should do the same thing, but 
in a Suited in time in the distrib time distributed way and perhaps maybe even space distributed way if you combine federated learning with continual so you get at the same scale of data compute and model size but you just get to it sequentially yep. and the additional challenge is then i mean for example, with uh, invariant criteria. So any of those criteria that impose invariance, whether it's invariant risk minimization, RM games, uh, other things, or ILC, they all assume presence of different environments that hopefully share some uh, invariant mechanism that might or might not be causal, but also in some sense a different presence of all those at the same time, while in continual learning, the situation is more challenging. You do see those different environments or out of distribution, well, distributions, but you see them one at a time, typically. Mm -hmm. And to me, I mean, I, I think you can explore both approaches. It just continual learning approach seem to be a bit more um, realistic and scalable because you distribute this compute in time. And sustainable, I would say. <laughs> yeah. So basically, to me, doing things pursuing continual and federated learning seems to be a more practical way towards the exactly same goal as kind of the compute data model size to infinity, but open AI way. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, perhaps if we had the resources that open AI has, uh, we could do that, but do we really have to? Yeah. I guess that's, that's a question. So maybe we can do what evolution did in time and in space maybe not yeah, yeah. so i don't know that's uh, basically i question. totally agree with you in it and thanks for the nice uh you know vision that tries to put together different things and different fields together and and and, and, and join this discussion about continual learning robustness and and all the things that we have uh discussed about uh previously uh, yeah, in fact, I, I totally agree with the, the fact that uh, continuous learning is a, is a way of uh, learning and generalizing through time uh, in a sustainable way. Instead of uh, because even the open AI approach that you just described, it, at the end of the day, uh, as uh, we know that the, the universe somehow is always expanding, uh, is going to need to integrate new data into their 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 model, yeah. right? So they will have to keep doing exactly it so exactly so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's not yeah. it's totally not sustainable because uh, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, if, as an organization, one can do that, but also in in a way, uh, I mean, this is not sustainable at all if you consider that we all want uh, to make these intelligent systems and we cannot, uh, you know, uh, have uh, infinite uh, infinite uh, resources at hand. So yeah. it's is is continual learning for me is the only way of a sustainable, let's say, way of learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in any case, I think the adopting uh, the invariance enforcing frameworks of different kind to continual learning setting is very interesting direction to be. <laughs> all right. And, uh, so thank you all for for uh, uh, these interesting discussion. I think that we are now a bit uh, uh, out of time and we have discussed a lot. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, the speakers and all the people that joined the discussion again. Uh, I hope to see you again in the next uh, meetup uh, next month, uh, or you can always join our uh, weekly uh, lean group session uh, that we have uh, at Continual AI always online. So thank you all again all for joining, and I hope to see you, to see you soon. Yeah, thank you all of you. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.